This is Corey Willis with PPI, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. This is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Braden Fleece, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. The other day I was chatting with Lenny and Ryan from Dynamite Diesel Products, and it was such a cool, insightful conversation. I'm like, hold up, guys. We have got to do a podcast about this. People are going to love hearing what you guys are saying and the whole context of the conversation. So today we're going to sit down with them, and we're going to chat about the vision that Dynamite Diesel Products has for the diesel industry ways that they can get extra power and performance and drivability out of the new trucks and also the old ones and some really cool things they're going to be doing with injector nozzles and full injector sets and then also you know lenny was telling us about his journey in the diesel industry diesel performance and some highs and lows we know there's a lot of shop owners out there that are in this same position either now or they have been or they're looking for some inspiration and definitely want to hear what lenny has to say All right, guys, let's get to the podcast with Lenny and Ryan from Dynamite Diesel Products and talking about the state of diesel and also how to maintain a healthy balance if you're a shop owner or just an entrepreneur in general. Lenny and Ryan, I am really excited to have both of you guys on the Diesel Podcast today. There was some conversations we've had where they were so fun and I'm like, we've got to do a podcast where we just kind of all talk and everyone gets to hear about some really cool things that are happening in in diesel new opportunities and then also you know for the business owners out there some you know with some of these changes things they can do to to be successful make sure their companies thrive and and you know capitalize on the the opportunity that's out there so i'm really glad to have both of you on today and be able to chat with you guys here for a bit awesome yeah thanks for having us patrick we appreciate you having us today man it's uh first monday of the year and uh it's, it's a good way to kick it off it is yeah there's there's been a lot that's been going on you know the last three six months that you know Lenny when we were chatting the other day you had a lot of really great insights and I want to just kind of turn the mic over to you in the sense of just there's so many great ideas and so much excitement and vision you have for diesel performance and I wanted to ask you how do you view the next few months the next year the next couple years as it pertains to diesel trucks and performance and racing and modifications and just the whole culture of diesel um, well, I mean, I feel like, uh, the potential for any shop owner or for any e-commerce person right now, and this is contrary to what people are believing at this very moment, but I feel the potential is way greater than ever before, hands down by landslides. Because like when I started this, my business kicked off in 2000 and in 2000, I was working trucks that were 96 97, 98, 99, and 2000s. Anything older than that, we just didn't really choose to work on. There was plenty enough work within those four years of trucks that we didn't have to work on older stuff. Um, and throughout the years, we, we kind of brought it in, and we started working on some of the older indirect stuff, but primarily 99% of our business was a four-year span of trucks, and we stayed busy. That being said, Later on, here we are, you know, fast forward to 2020, which is an amazing, I'll tell you stories about, like, how I felt the morning that I woke up the the day after 2020 began. January 1st, it was amazing to me, and I'll tell you why here in a bit. But here we are. We've got trucks that are 24 years old, still on the road. We've got companies that are specializing in trying to restore these trucks. Um, That, to me, is mind-blowing because I never thought I'd be in an industry ever to where I could call the Dodge dealer and just buy a wiring harness or buy an ECM or call the Ford shop and say, look, I need a door handle. And now these trucks are 24 years old. They're classics. And, you know, you got like uh, Chris and Paul Rutledge. Those guys are specializing in OBS stuff. Uh, I think it's fantastic because they're, they're chasing a niche market. It's going to pay the bills, and it's going to keep all those older trucks on the road. It's cool. To me, it's really cool. But then – you know, fast forward to, to what's been happening since 2007, 2008. We get an emissions thing that is kind of miserable, and nobody's good at it yet. Or didn't, you know, they weren't great at it. They were shooting flames out the tailpipe. Dodge wasn't great at it. You know, Chevy wasn't great at it. And here we are, you know, a decade later. And I don't really, I mean, I've the last two duallys that I've had did not get the emissions gear field off of them. And I don't have any problems. Like, all we've done has been putting injectors in the trucks. It's not like I can just say it was a grand slam right out of the, you know right out of the shoot. It wasn't, but especially on the 2019, 2020 stuff, 
my Ram Cummins, I've had the injectors out of it. Oh, I think Joe's probably pulled them out four or five times. And we've got recipes now that work pretty damn good, but it's taken some research. And, and I'm excited about it. And I think that for any shop owner out there, like the number one thing you should do is find out who the hell you can send your text to and yourself and learn what an SCR does, learn what a DPF does, learn how um, the EGR system works. And once you're good at that stuff, once you understand how all that stuff functions and how it works proper, uh, I believe that the potential for your own profitability and your own vacations and your own happiness, that potential is all there in greater numbers now than it's ever been before, period. Yeah, I think much to – this is Ryan. I think much to any point, you know, there's – in 20 years, think about how far we've come with just social media, YouTube, uh, things that we can actually tune into. And, and you know, Dynamite Diesel uh, TV on, the, on YouTube is – it's got some of the coolest videos if you want to learn about those earlier trucks like what he's talking about, all the way up to the, the current platforms you're working on, like his 2019 uh, Ram 6.7. Um, sky's the limit. You know, and, and like he was talking about as far as training goes, we do a, we do a certified training every year with our dealers, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that in there. Well, like when I, when I think back, and I'm sure you're going to know this way better than I will, Lenny, but, like, I think back to the older trucks, right? And somebody, you know, would call you up and say, hey, I want a 550, 600 horsepower 12 valve. And, you know, back then you could definitely do it. But what I think some of the newer diesel owners may not know or weren't really into them then and aren't familiar with it is it wasn't like it was just you do a few things and here's your 600 horsepower tow rig. There was a five to $6,000 transmission. There's probably a compound turbo setup. There's injectors. There's all this money that would go into these older trucks to be able to get them to that level versus these newer ones with all the emission stuff on them. There's so many products and so much technology out there that you can have that for less money as far as modifications in the aftermarket was concerned. So you still have that kind of fun factor, the drivability, being able to tow a trailer better. And I know that's a kind of a major part on the truck owner side is they're thinking, well, what about these new trucks? Like, are they still, can I still do stuff to them? What's, what's, uh, you know, what's the future look like for those? Is it still going to be like the diesel industry as I knew it when I got into it, which might've been two or three or five years ago? You know, that's one thing that you've already said. That's kind of been, uh, it's been a real thorn in my side for a couple of years is everybody's been asking me like, well, what are you going to do when people quit buying diesel trucks? And I'm like, what, what is wrong with you people? Because, and I get it. Like, I own a 2018 GNC Yukon. It's the short bus, not the long bus. 5.3 liter and stock and 225 horsepower is higher. And it was a good driving vehicle. Um, I know that they, they last. I, you know, my, my ex-wife owned one for 100,000 miles with a 6 liter, and it was a good car. Uh, that being said, I went ahead and I bought one because whenever I got people that come to town, the people that come to town – they're, you know, they fly into Spokane. I run up Spokane. I pick them up. When I pick them up in Spokane, I bring them back to the house. We hang out for a couple of days. And I don't really want them to be uncomfortable with their luggage, and it might be two or three people. So the Yukon works for that, right? That being said, I've also got, like, a 23-foot, like, uh, surf boat. Actually, it's my kids, but I drag it around. The, the Yukon, even with fast forward to today, it's got a Magnuson supercharger on it. It's got a camshaft, Cook's headers, and it makes 530 horsepower to the tire and like 600 pounds feet. It still doesn't tow like a stock Dodge truck. Not even close. It's not heavy enough. The brakes aren't big enough. The steering doesn't feel comfortable with, you know, a 7,000-pound boat behind me. So that's when people are like, oh, man, all these guys are convert back to gas because it's more reliable. No, they're not. Camp trailers are bigger, boats are bigger, campers are bigger. People aren't going to convert back to gas because the minute you put a V10 in something, it gets five miles to the gallon when you're trying to go camping, and it's not very reliable when you're at 5,000 RPM going up the hill. That's a really good point. That's, that's a good point about my – actually, my brother, he is uh, he's in construction, and it was in the same you know kind of scenario. It's like he's not going to buy an EcoBoost or a gas truck – to tow some of the equipment around us. So he ordered a 2020 Ram and he's like, I need this. It's not so much for, you know, racing or something like that, but for my job, for my work to make a livelihood, I need something with this kind of torque and drivability. Absolutely. 
And his 2020 Ram, the steering and the brakes on that thing are insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got a 2020 Dually, and with a 40-foot flat deck and two trucks on the trailer behind me, you can roll down the road at 80 mile an hour, set the cruise, and you, I mean, literally, you kind of, it drives so good and the brakes work so good and all the interior amenities like cruise control and, you know, it's got, uh, what do you call that, where if the guy in front of you speeds up or slows down, the truck does the same. Yeah, yeah it's cool. All that stuff works so good. You just forget that there's 40 feet and like 20,000 pounds behind you. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the big three, I mean, they're not, they're not switching their ways. They're going to continue to come out diesel trucks that, uh, you know, with better low carry capacity, more horsepower, and, and super cool technology. Uh, it's those companies like DDP that, you know, are setting the path for uh, what they do to, uh, you know, keep up with that kind of technology to bring cool products to the market for, you know, somebody that wants a little bit of extra horsepower. Earlier, Lenny, you had mentioned shop owners learning about the emission systems. And I wanted to ask you, as it relates to DDP, is what have you found with these newer trucks and the products that you guys make and specialize in, how you're able to increase performance, reliability, drivability within the the framework of, of what these new diesel trucks come with? Um, so I'm not... Uh, admittedly, I'm not the smartest guy, I promise you. Like, there's a lot of really smart people, and I'm not one of them. But I've been doing this so long that I've seen a lot of different things in the diesel industry kind of come and go. And I've always been really curious. Like, I will say that I've got ADD that's semi-controlled, meaning, like, I, I do an okay job of managing it, but not often. And I get bored. And when I get bored, I buy a new tool, the new tool is usually expensive, and then it makes me work really hard to get it paid off, and i got to get good at it, or it wasn't really worth buying, right? Right. Whole technology, like the actual spray orifice the diesel flows through, there is so much to that. And it's only like four to six tenths of a millimeter in, in length. But what happens to the fluid as it goes through that four to six tenths millimeter and how the shape of that hole is, is key to the success of a DPF or a sled pull truck or a drag race truck or anything. And we call the, like where the fluid goes from the inside the nozzle when the pintle valve lifts and then the fluid starts to transfer through the spray orifice, the first part is the K factor. And we've always tried to radius that K factor. Um, and with extrude hone technology, the radiusing is really easy to, to do. You can make it perfect. It's much, much nicer, depending on the media um, and what you're using for media and what the abrasiveness is. There's different holes, different hole sizes, and you have to use a different media per each hole size every few thousandths of an inch because the media won't work. If you're using too soft a media with cutting agent that's too small, it won't do any work on a hole that's 20 thousandths. But it might work great from four up to seven thousandths. So, We've been studying that for, you know, since two, I bought that tool in 04, and I bought the bore scope in probably 05, and since then we've upgraded the bore scope probably three times, you know, because we keep getting better cameras and better cording and things like that, and they just wear out. But, uh, you know, looking at K-Factor, we, we knew that the limitation of extrude hone was coming to us. Um, I reached out to the extrude hone company and tried to get some newer ideas and technology, and I didn't really feel like that was going to be the answer. So, oh, five years ago, I tried to buy my first EDM, and uh, I called up. They said, oh, yeah, we've got, you know, a tool that can do that, and it comes with chrome bumpers and air conditioning. I was like, whoa, I can't afford that. The tool was, I think I got a quote for five, six hundred grand. And I, I legitimately was like, no, there's just no way that I can afford to buy a tool like that. And then it just it won't ever pencil out. So this last year they called me up and they said, hey, Len, you know, and he was kind of saucy about it. He was like, so whatever scared you off? And I was like, dude, honestly, I couldn't afford to buy another house. Because <laughs> your tool was more than my house. I just can't, you know, I live fairly, fairly, uh, you know, uh, calm and fairly subdued and, uh, my house was like 420 grand, and your tool was more than that. I can't really do it. So he kind of laughed, and he goes, well, what if I could give you a better deal? And I was like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, here we are a few years later, and technology's gotten better, and we've gotten better at it. So 
you know, we could probably come down. And I was like, well, you know, starting at five or 600, coming down doesn't necessarily mean a lot. So he shot me a quote, and uh, I actually bid on it. So I was really excited about it. Um, the first quote was something that I thought was so palatable. I thought, man, I'm going to have this thing paid off in a year or two, no problem. And then, you know, of course, driving down the road, which I do a lot, I'm starting to think to myself, like, what if I'm getting a tool that's not going to do what I need it to do? So I called him up and I said, you know, pump the brakes. I know you've got a PO. Financing's been approved, but stop. Don't, don't work on my machine anymore until I come out and I touch it, feel it, smell it. And I got out there and I looked at it and then I started talking about some of the things that we're going to need it to do and it wouldn't do some of that stuff. Probably 30 to 40% of the stuff that I'm going to need it to do, it wasn't capable of doing. And I was like, you know, I'm not mad. I'm just like, okay, stop. Like, I don't want this tool. And, you know, they're all looking at me like, what, what the hell are we supposed to do with this thing? Because it's, you know, like we're already working on it. And I'm like, well, you know, unfortunately, I – you didn't know my limited amount of EDM technology, and I didn't know what questions to really ask, but I can tell you right now that's not going to work for me, so I can't buy it. Well, the next step up is double the money, and I'm like, well, you know, if I can't do 30 to 40% of my work, then I can't really not afford to spend the next double the money. So I called up my daughter who does the daily books and whatnot and uh, said, yeah, that machine's not going to work, so we're going to have to double down on this, and she... You know, she she was pretty animated in her response to that, but it is what it is. And um, so the the machine's being built, and I'm really super excited about this because one of the really big OEMs um, who has yellow as their uh, their color, kind of an <laughs> orangey industrial looking yellow, that company <clears throat> ordered four of these machines, and they took possession of three of the machines. They left the fourth one, and over the last few years, you know, of course, the, the place that's making the EDMs, like, well, there's a $40,000 part strapped to that thing right there, and it's not moved yet, so steal it off there. And there's a $60,000 part strapped to it, so, so steal that one off there. So this table's sitting there, and I'm like, well, I got to do something. And one of the guys yells out, he goes, hey, get that goddamn thing out of here. Sell him that one. And I look at this table, and it's this stripped down, you know, it's, it's basically just a big chunk of steel sitting in the middle of the floor. And then they explain to me where it came from and why it's sitting there and why it's stripped down, and, you know, like basically they can rebuild it. So they're putting that one together right now with all the latest, you know, controls and technologies, and um, we're hoping that it's completed and running uh, sometime late in January, and myself and uh, one of my guys, Skyler, are going to run out there and we're going to spend a week or two learning how to program it. And programming is key. Like, if you're really good at programming these things, then you can do some amazing stuff. But amazing, I mean, like, so with really high pressures and with injector time being so critical, like it's on and it's off, um, with injection rate being so imperative with, like, DPF and EGR stuff living, technology's got to get way better. And... Uh, Basically, like right now, if you talk to anybody, they're like, was that a 5 by 18 or is that a 5 by 20 And then you try and pin gauge it, and it's like not real close to either one kind of a deal. So this machine that we're buying, if, Patrick, if you called me up and you said, hey, I want some eight hole nozzles at 144 degrees, and I want them at six thousandths of an inch, I'd be like, all right, great. Um do you want any other sets? Like, do you want to try them at 143? Do you want to try them at 145? Do you want them at 146? I can change the degrees of angle within every degree. And are you sure you want them at six thousandths of an inch? Because I can do six thousandths and a tenth. I can do six thousandths and two tenths of an inch. Six thousand. Do you want them at five thousandths and nine tenths? Like, that's the kind of accuracy we'll have now. And if the call out is say six thousandths and two tenths of a thou. I'll be able to hold that hole within 50 millionths of one inch. So that's, like, now oh. we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, we just got real <laughs> and really expensive, too. But, yeah, and, and really, my whole thing has always been, like, stay with the injectors because that's what you're good at. That's what you're efficient at, and someday it'll pay off. 
And you know, I kind of feel like with the technology and people wanting to make more power, the OEMs might not have spent as much time on the dyno trying to figure out exactly how much they get out of it because it made whatever it needed to make to brag that you know our Ford's more horsepower Dodges. And as long as they can brag about it, then they can sell trucks, right? Yep. But if Dynamite buys a Ford and we find another 30 to 40 to 50 horsepower, then all of a sudden you get basically stock truck, stock tune, stock emissions, and it picks up 40, 50 horse. That's what's been one of the really exciting things <clears throat> that, it, you know, in our, in our conversations and in, in the diesel industry in general is the amount of technology that exists now and the potential for like what you just mentioned, finding another 30, 40, 50 horsepower and the precision is where I think that opportunity that you talked about earlier really comes into play is the opportunity for companies, for truck owners, for the aftermarket to succeed comes from is the the tools that are there now. It's totally different than they used to be. You know, I, the, this tooling, the, the EDM technology has been out since the 60s for sure. Um, I was really fortunate to meet two of the OGs, and, you know, they've been in it for a very long time. And then when I was walking their plant and I was touring the shop, one of the, like, numero uno OG, like, EDM guy number one, uh, he showed up just for a drive-by. Like, he just swung in to say hi and, you know, kind of chat with all the crew and stuff because, you know, he, he, he worked with these guys for decades. And uh, he was just kind of cruising by and was, like, saying hi. So I got to shake his hand and take a picture with him. And, you know, it was just it was cool. But it's not that this stuff hasn't been out there. It's just that it's only been available for the OEMs that could afford to swing it. And at this point, like, I'm old enough now that I can't really get out and go back to doing something totally different. Like, I may buy a house, restore it, flip it, or turn it into a rental. But I'm not going to become a full-time contractor. You know what I'm saying? I can't. I can't get out of what I'm doing and, and go be a professional something else for the next 10, 15 years of my life and then retire. It's not, I don't have enough time. So I figured that, you know, I've got to really knuckle down and I've got to make this happen for me. And I'm certainly hoping that, you know, since I've been doing this for 20 years, I'm hoping that I can start to teach some of the younger guys and the younger gals in this industry there's profitability you have to maintain. And, you know, I say that meaning when I was young and I started, there was another guy that was fairly young, a little bit older than me. His name is Peter Pfeiffer, and he had this company called South Bend Clutch. And we were selling some South Bend Clutches, and I was super excited to get to know these guys because, you know, I'd just been to Las Vegas, and we, we hung out at Pahrump, Nevada, and we did the, the May Madness thing for the Turbo Diesel Register, and I was getting to know all these new cool people. It's exciting and all that. So I'm talking to Peter on the phone one morning, and he goes, hey, man, if you can't make a living doing this in 40 hours a week, sell your tools and go get another job. And I, that's the complete opposite of what I was telling myself. I was telling myself that I'm going to be 50, 60, 70 hours a week for the first three, four, or five years because you have to. Like, that's what everybody tells you is, as soon as you start a new company, you've got to submerge yourself in it. And you've got to really you know, do it. That's true. I still feel like that's true to a point because, like, for a hot minute, when I get this EDM, you won't see me, you won't hear me. I'm going to be 60, 70 hours a week on this thing until I become a master at it. And when I become a master and everybody says, hey, we need this, hey, we need that, and I can do it with, you know, almost no effort, then I'll be back down to my, like, 40 hours a week. But Peter wasn't wrong. You know, if you can't do something and get it right in 40 hours a week, trying to beat yourself up for 60 hours a week for 10 years is not going to make it any better. It's going to make it worse. It's going to kill your health. It's going to kill your family. Your company's not going to really be successful. And, you know, statistics don't lie. Like, soon after that, it was within five years, Peter Piper didn't work a Wednesday. So he come to work Monday. He come to work Tuesday. He takes Wednesdays off. He hangs out with his wife. He comes back to work Thursday and Friday, and then he's got Saturday and Sunday off. I thought, man, this guy's like bread. But when you take that Wednesday and you start thinking about your wife and your home and your company, then Thursday and Friday you're super fresh and you're dialed in and you just want to go make it happen. Again, I feel like overtraining is a thing. And if, you, you know, if you're using your company as your, your, your life 
pretty soon your life just, you know, gets ruined. The, the, the kids, you know, like you didn't go to the, the, the football games. You didn't go to the baseball games. You weren't the coach um, at the Kiwi, you know, like all that stuff. And so those are mistakes I made, really. Like uh, I just – I was too deep in the company and I was ignorant. And, you know, it, it did cause me to lose my company. Like I, I got a divorce. I didn't read my own mail for nine years. Like that was my fault and things went sideways. So, yeah, I mean – it it was kind of weird because, and do you guys mind if I get into another topic just about like the health of a shop owner? I w- I was just thinking that while while you were you were chatting, I'm like, there's there's shop owners that are listening that are right in this position, and then there's also truck owners out there. They might be in a completely different industry, but the business principles are still the same. And so yeah, I'm, I'm like, just keep going, Lenny. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I didn't want to hijack the whole thing, but, but I do feel strong about this because I got my ass kicked hard. Like I was, I, I've always been like a gym goer. And one morning I leave the gym and I'm with my two meathead buddies and we're standing at the protein shake shop and my phone blows up and, and I get a, get three or four, um, your account balance is zero. Your account balance is zero. Your account balance is zero. And I'm like, what the hell? Oh, huh, that's weird. And I, you know, like, if it would have been one account, I would have been like, what the hell's gone wrong? But when all of your accounts are to zero, you're thinking, well, the bank just put a reset button down or something. Like, it's no big deal. Yeah. Um, so I leave the protein shake shop, not even nervous. I wasn't even like, I felt no anxiety. I really felt like there was some electronic gizmo that it was no big deal. So I walked in and I was like, hey, Lynn. So you want to take a look at our accounts real quick and check this out? Because she used to work at the bank. And she's like, yeah, okay, you know, no problem. And then uh, pretty soon my ex-wife rolls in, like earlier than normal. And uh, I walk up to her office, and her and the, her assistant were in there. And I'm like, so what's going on? And she's like, well, you know, we, uh, we kind of owe the IRS some money. And I'm like, oh, shit, that's not good. No, but, you know, we, uh, so they took it. And I'm like, okay, well, how much do we owe them? Well, 140 grand. I thought, oh shit, that's kind of a lot. But now we only owe them like 20 grand because they just took 120 grand. So, in my really positive outlook, I walk out to the shop and I start counting trucks. I'm looking at who's working at what shop, on what truck. And within five minutes, I was like, all right, by the end of today, we're going to bill out another $17,000. And the wheels are back on the bus. We can haul more passengers. We're going to make more money and we're going to pay this sucker off like no big deal. I'm, I'm over it. Um, so I walk into the, uh, the ex-wife office and I'm like, Hey, so here's the, so I got this, this, this going out today. This will done. This will be done. Everything's good. And she still looks pretty damn nervous, but you know, I mean, we did this lose 120 grand. So I guess there's that. I, I just kind of gave it that. And I asked, I says, well, give me the phone number to whoever I got to talk to. And that's when things got super sideways. So I went ahead and called the tax agent. He calls me up like three days later. And he says, you know, he announces his name, says he works for the Internal Revenue Service. And I'm like, okay, great, you know. So, you know, if you could give me like 15, 20 grand back, it, it would get me up to speed and I would be able to pay you back faster. And he says, well, Mr. Reed, if that was so easy, then why would you owe the Internal Revenue Service now? Why, why would you not have just pay it on time? I said, sir, I didn't know anything about this. I don't do the bills. I don't do the books. But I, you know, I'm well aware of it now, and apparently we still owe you about $20,000. So I'd like to get that paid to you within the next 30 days, and I'd like to get all the rest of my people all caught back up. This is definitely going to cramp my style, but I'll get through it. He says, uh, Mr. Reed, how much did you say that you owed the uh, Internal Revenue Service? And I said, well, I owed you about 140 ish and you just took about 120 ish so I owe you about 20 ish You give me back 20 makes things easier for me. I get you your 40 back. In, in like a month. And that's when he says, uh, now guys, this is like, this is not a joke. He says, and I'm, I'm driving this like 06 Dodge Mega Cab with the air conditioning cranked up, and I'm by myself in the truck, in the cab of this Mega Cab, right? And he says to me, uh, Mr. Reed, you currently owe the IRS like $563,000. And by the end of this billing cycle, it's going to tip right over six hundred. dollars the cab of that truck got really hot and wow. really small in a second. And that changed my life. That moment right then and there changed my life because 
up till that point, I was a bully. I was yelling at people. I was constantly trying to promote people. You know, there used to be a TV show where this uh, dad and the son made, like, choppers on TV, right? And they were always fighting in the shop, and that's how yeah. they treated me. Well, that was the only thing I knew. And this kid comes up to me one day, really good kid, and he was, you know, great to work with. And he goes, Len, I just uh, I can't work with you. It's just too damn much. Like there's, you, you just get too tense and too stressed out, and it just makes me kind of uneasy here. And I said, okay, you know what? Like I'll change. And it's, I did a much better job of controlling it, but there was, you know, a lifetime of habits there. And after that dude told me that I owed him that much, I was like, okay, you've definitely done some shit wrong. Like now, of course, instantly, like the number one thing that anybody would say is like, well, it's my business partner's fault for getting us in this position. And partially that's true, but if you truly want to get humble and you truly want to fix the situation, you've got to say it's my fault because I shouldn't have given my business partner that much leeway and that much line to hang both of us. And, uh, you know, guys, like, that started in 09, 10, somewhere in there. And, of course, back then the rumors were spreading that I was going broke and this, that, and the other. And the rumors weren't really wrong. It was a tough time. But, Again, like I just never gave up. I wasn't going to give up. Got my way through it, and then, you know, here I am today. And I look at young shop owners that work with their wives and stuff. Whether you own a restaurant, whether you own a construction company, whether you own a diesel shop, make sure that everybody whose name is on all of the insurance certificates and all of the business licenses, make sure those people know where the taxes are at and where the bills are at. It might not be what you're good at. You might be the greatest technician on the planet and get frustrated when it comes to money. Then hire an accountant, a professional CPA, to walk out once a month and do an audit over what's going on in your company. And make sure that you get along with that person. If that person's cool and they talk to you on a level that you understand, the conversation won't be painful. There's a ton of different accountants out there. Some of them are high speed, some of them are low speed. Pick one that you get along with personally because when he signs off on it, it's his ass on the line. As long as you understand what's coming out of his mouth, your company is going to be in better shape. Um, that's one of the mistakes I made. And really, you know, my kids got involved in all that. Like, it was just a mess. Um, and that's why I'm so thankful for today. Like, I woke up January 1st, 2020, and I thought, man, that decade tested me. You know, I never have been sick in my life up until that decade. Um, I got uh, pneumonia for five, six weeks. I, I missed work almost every single hour for five or six weeks, and I, I laid on the couch, damn near died, lost 35 pounds. Six months later, I got strep throat. Six months later, I got pneumonia. And uh, fortunately for me, like one of my buddies came over to check on me, and um, Lonovan Harris came over one day, and uh, it, it's a nine-hour drive. And... Uh, he comes in, he's like, man, you look like shit. I said, man, I feel horrible. And I laid on the couch and passed out, and uh, he watched a movie on the chair next to me, and kid, I woke up, and he's like, man, what the hell's wrong with you? And I was covered in hives. Well, didn't know it, but I was allergic to the stuff they were giving me to beat the pneumonia. So that, that, was, that was a rough time, but, man, you learn a lot. You really learn about the people in your life that give a shit. Um, another buddy of mine shows up here from Six Hour Drive, and he says, you used to be the cardio king, and you can't run a quarter mile. Like, we got to fix you. And I thought, you know, he's not wrong. And fortunately, I've become friends with some other guys that are really into physical fitness and whatnot. But what's funny about that is their companies are all on point. Everybody I know that's got, like, a fit body has a fit brain and a fit company. It's kind of a weird deal. Like, numerically, I don't know. Is it just an odds thing? Is it just a numbers thing? But to me, it's, it's helped me out a lot, and I really, yeah, like, any questions, guys? I feel like I'm just rambling at this point. I think it's a really, really good point, because a lot of the messages that we will we'll get from shop owners are not necessarily people who have just started. They're kind of in that middle ground where they've done it for a while, they've gotten good, they've established a customer base, and then we look at the diesel aftermarket or performance industry and changes that have happened over the years. And as a result, their business plan might change a little bit. I think we see that with, you know, some of the, just the parts that are available or what truck owners are asking for. And it's so 
easy, I think, to get caught in that where you're just like, I've got to focus. I'm not going to pay attention to the bills or the taxes or other things or myself or my health or what I eat or what I do. And I think you know, when you had mentioned, you know, these, these business owners, they have, you know, they're fit, their companies are on point. It's, it's a habit, whether that's running or thinking or downtime, which is really important as well when you're always, you know, just on the go and you got the stresses and you got employees and, and you're trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to stay ahead of the curve? But you also got to take care of yourself as well. You're, you're so correct. Like, and they, it's, it's super easy. You know, like, as I went through my divorce, uh, Washington State required us to take a class. It was called For Kids' Sake. So they give you a handout, make you study it, and then they make you come and you sit in this class with a bunch of other people that get divorced because they would not give us a divorce back then without finishing this course. And during the course, I was like, okay, um, I think I'm healthier than a lot of people in this room, but I'm not healthy yet. Like mentally, I'm not where I need to be. I'm not focusing on the things I need to focus on. Um, and I started going to therapists. And I, I kid you guys not. Like I went to six different therapists over the course of a couple of years. And a lot of that was because like I would walk in with a patented like speech and I'm like, hey guys, here's the deal. I'm not dumb, but I... I understand, like, wiring schematics and, and fluid, you know, componentry. I want to know my brain, how it's wired. So when something happens, what's going to fire, where's it going to go to, and how's it going to turn out? Like, I just want to know the layout of the land in my head so I can sort of uh, stop some of those things. And, you know, again, there's a bunch of different personalities, and some therapists looked at me like, okay, that's, that's truthfully impossible. You can't really learn that. And some therapists, well, one of them in particular, I had some aha moments sitting there. And those aha moments for me might not be the same for you. But only I know where I'm weak and where I'm really strong. And some of us posture up and get cocky and try to act strong, look strong at certain things. We talk um, like we know a lot about something when we really don't know shit about it. Um, you know, you, like in the mixed martial arts world, you see a guy in the, in the bar and he's, he's dropping, you know, he's name dropping every arm bar and every Tamora and all that happy horse shit as he's watching this fight. But he's never sat in a ring. He's never been in a training session in his life. Well, that's cocky. It's not confident, right? Right. I think there's a bunch of people that do that daily. Like they talk about things and a lot of it's in our head. And if it's in your head, in your body and it's in your day and it's in your program and it's just a mess. So I went to therapist for a couple of years and it wasn't like I sat there going, man, I'm a nut. You got to give me a bunch of prescriptions. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but trying to understand like where you're at emotionally, where you're at like physically, like, you know, if you're a carpenter and daily you tell yourself, where do I hurt? Does my soul hurt? No, I'm in pretty good shape in my soul. Like I'm in a good mood. I'm in a good spot. But every single day your thumb hurts, well, how does it hurt? Well, because I keep smacking it with a hammer. Pretty soon, you either need to figure out how to hold the nail differently or aim better or quit swinging the hammer at your thumb. And there's a lot of that stuff. Like when you're in a bad mood as a shop owner, what just happened that tipped you over and put you in a bad mood? And if you're going to pick up a phone and say, you know, good morning, it's dynamite diesel, and you're – you're kind of rough already, is that customer who, who's just calling you for the first time, are they really going to want to come in and spend money with you? So your mood really dictates your, your outcome and your, your bank account you know, balance in the end. So you want to be, to me, you know, like there's, there's work ethics, but if you feel like you're working upstream all the time instead of downstream all the time, like going downstream, you're, you know, it's fun, it's fast. You're getting somewhere quick, and it's not taking a lot of effort. But if it's always upstream, then, man, you're working with the wrong people, or you're working in the wrong thing, or you're doing the wrong thing, maybe, maybe you're just not good at it. Maybe you need to go see a coach that's better. If you're a tranny builder and you struggle and every tranny you put together is a warranty, maybe you need to hang out with somebody else that can give you a few pointers to fix all your problems. Maybe it's not just the shitty goddamn parts you keep buying, you know what I'm saying? Like, we always want to blame other stuff. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's truly about the balance, man. And uh, Lenny, I don't think you could have touched on it more uh, than you did. Um, you know, that's one of the things too. I think these shop owners can, you know, fall back on is 
uh, you know, those things in life. Family and, and business is important, but uh, balance is key, man. One of the, the things that, that kind of pumped me up, <clears throat> Lenny, is this is, I, I love I love hearing the stories behind it because we look at it, you know, we're talking about diesel trucks and the aftermarket and stuff, but we look back at your story and what you went through, and then you fast forward to, say, 2019, you're probably looking at it like, I have conquered 10 times or 50 times or 100 times harder than this. So, you know, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to make sure that, that, you know, you have the tools and the people and the processes in place to be successful. But then also at the very beginning we were chatting, you said, you know, I'm not going to go do something else. And I know there's a lot of people listening, even if they're not shop owners, but they're in another industry or something like that, where maybe it's not time, but maybe it's passion. And I think they're looking at this because there is there is negativity out there that says, oh, well, the diesel industry's done. You need to go get a, a 6.2 liter or a 5.3 or you need to get this. It's all over. Well, if that's your passion, you have no other choice. Somebody once told me, you don't know how strong you are until that's your only option. Well, it's kind of the same thing. Is if this is what you're passionate about, this is what you want to do, there's no reason to quit. That, that's where the opportunity that we talked about in the beginning part of the podcast, I think, really comes from. Is If you're passionate about it, and you have the mindset and you've overcome these things, I'm sure you look at this, you know, the, the whole dynamics and landscape of diesel performance, like, I got this. You you can't replace passion with, you know, that it, it makes everything. And, you know, I one of the guys, one of the teams um, that I feel is the most successful in the diesel industry is the guys at Firepunk. Like, those guys are up at 4 in the morning, laughing and giggling and having a good time and working because they have to race in tomorrow. That passion. And they're also good at it. Um, you know, it, it's not just about passion. Like, let's just say that, like, I meet a hot chick and she's totally into, like, you know, rock bands and guitar players. Like, I may become passionate to learn how to play the guitar. Let's be honest. I'm probably not <laughs> going to be really good at it anytime <laughs> in the near future. And that passion is not my passion. I'm chasing somebody else's passion, trying to become a guitar player because they're passionate about music. It's not my passion, right? Right. So, yeah. But, yeah, you, you look at, like, Firepunk. Those guys really aren't that old in this industry. But they've won UCC. They've killed UCC. They've been to DPC. They've won. They've got a lot of happy customers. They've done a lot of work. And that's passion with a team that all gets along and gets shit done. I, I got a lot of respect for those guys, period. And I got, you know, I mean, there's, I've got a bunch of my own friends, but I bring out Firepunk because it's, it's a popular name in the industry and a lot of people can relate to it, right? Right. Yeah, they're definitely known for, for I think they've set their own standard in a way, not just with parts, but with racing and the things they've accomplished is, is that. And I think that's what this, you know, this podcast is really about is that, the opportunity that's there and the balance, which we all want to see. And I'm sure there's going to be dozens of questions that people have that uh, they'll, they'll call in or email or find you guys on social media, send you a direct message and, and we'll get some as well. But this is, is really insightful. And I know that this topic is, it, it's, it, it's something that I know we're both interested in. And, you know, we were chatting the other day. I'm like, this needs to be a podcast like this, People need to hear this stuff. It's, it's outside of the typical, you know, kind of, say, product information or technical information that our listeners, you know, tune in for. But it's definitely a side of it. And it and it relates back to the trucks. It relates back to why why people are buying diesel trucks, why they modify them, why they do, you know, build a race vehicle or something like that. And how it all kind of pulls together. And so it was really exciting. But I wanted to ask you guys if... If uh, you know, there's people that have questions or they want to, they want to pose more questions for us to do on another podcast. What's the best way for them to, you know, get in contact with you guys and and uh, give us some ideas for you know another episode or another topic to cover? Yeah, we have a, a few different channels. Obviously, we got our uh, website, which you know, our website we launched a, a whole new uh, uh, platform uh, for the end consumer to come check out and our products videos. Uh, but you can uh, reach us. Our direct phone number is 208-209-3214. Um, any of the guys in the shop, uh, gals, they can get any of the tech questions uh, taken care of for you, uh, looking up orders, things like that. 
uh, talking about new products. We also, you can also email us at sales at dynamitediesel.com. Um, and then we got all of our social pages, whether it's uh, Dynamite Diesel TV on the YouTube, um, Instagram, or social media. Hit us any time with questions, whether it's a uh, you know, direct message, uh, interacting with any of the things we put up, uh, we'll, we'll definitely get back to you. I love going on your guys' YouTube channel. I watch those all the time. It's so cool to be able to see the either the product or the machine or just understand more about about injectors. So, yeah, I definitely encourage encourage people to go onto YouTube and, and check it out. And I know, Lenny, after you get back from mastering the machine, I definitely want to chat with you again about it and some of the, the cool things you've either learned or what it's allowing you guys to do with injector sets. It's... It's going to be pretty massive. Um, you know, like right now, anybody who's modifying a, a factory existing injector, you have to increase the hole size by about three thousandths of one inch. Now, like I said, we're going to be able to break that up into tenths of a thousandth of an increment, right? So if you're dealing with a, a five hole at eight and a half thousandths, you have to add three thousandths to that. And if it's too big at that point, well, you can't really, there's nothing for you in the middle. So what we did is, and this stresses out then again because, well, she's responsible for the money, but we've actually got nozzles being made and they're being finished with needle valve clearances within five micron, just like the OEM stuff. Uh, DLC coated, machined within five micron, lapped as a matching, so the nozzle will, will be lapped to the needle valve and it comes to us as a blank. So... Whether you own a fleet of vehicles that are trying to be very specific on whether you own uh, a drive-in service center and you want your own custom injection nozzle that works really good for your environment, let's just say, you know, because where you live, what's the elevation at, Patrick? It's about 5,300 feet. And people can leave 5,300 feet and go up to what elevation? Gosh, 10, 11,000, 12,000. All right. So obviously, if there's a shop that wants to make something extremely clean burning there. Yeah. They could call up and they'd say, all right, what's, here's where I start in elevation, and here's where we go in elevation, here's what pump we have, here's the kind of power we're trying to support, what do you guys recommend? And we would say, let's build you potentially a 10-hole nozzle at 4.6 thousandths of an inch. We're going to put them on bodies. You can install them in a truck. You can dine on them. You can drive them around. Let us know what you see. Send us videos. Let us know how the thing runs. And all of a sudden, the dude in Denver, Colorado, is becoming the guru locally because his trucks run really good. They run really clean. They've got throttle response like no other. The drawback to that, that's a very specialized nozzle, and it's only going to work really awesome at high elevations because when you get 10 holes revved up to 5,000 RPM, and the holes are so small, there's going to be any volume coming out of them. So it is a specialized nozzle for a niche market kind of a thing. But there again, if somebody calls us up and they say, hey, like, we're trying to run this thing from like 5,800 RPM to 6,500 RPM, what's your idea? Well, my idea is let's try a five hole or a six hole or a seven hole, and let's, let's start bumping up the volume and come up with, you know, there's just so many, the endless possibilities using blanks and trying to get blanks made was not easy, and it was not cheap. But very soon, like, all those experiments are going to be like NASA. We're just going to be able to do stuff endlessly, and I'm super excited about the future. It's going to be amazing. That's really that's really cool because I, I know the personal truck I had, there's a combo I was going to do, and somebody I knew lived in uh, Florida, they're like, oh, this, you know, they had the same truck. Oh, this combo is going to work great. doesn't smoke, doesn't haze. Well, then I do it at 5,300 feet, and I, I drive it around. I'm like, I can't do this. Like, so it's completely different. And so that precision and being able to do that is is really exciting. And I know we're, we're excited to see what you guys do with you know, the future of injectors and, and with these trucks. And definitely, like I said, want to sit down with you. You have to get, get the machine and, and get behind it and just, you know, what kind of feedback you're getting from people and any questions that people have from, from this episode. So it was great chatting with you guys today. I appreciate your time. Uh, in the you know the knowledge and and uh the expertise well if anybody needs to reach out to me about business questions or experience questions like they can get a hold of me on like instagram just lenny reed 
and uh, you know, shoot me a, a direct message. I will try to respond as quick as I can. Um, and if it's like product related or price related, please reach out to either the Ryan's or Brian Bailey. They're at the shop because they. I don't do pricing. I don't do any of that anymore. Like all I want to do is really if, stay out of the money side of it. I worry a lot less, and I can focus on making parts. And that's you know, listening to Ryan, like he's telling you all about the new platform and this and that and the other, like you can tell that those guys are, are a lot better at that end of it than I am. So, um, you know, if it's about product, reach out to those guys for sure and they'll get your prices and whatnot. And and if it's anything on your company, whether you're a, a construction worker or, or uh, you know, anything that you do and you're you're kind of in that middle ground, like I'd be happy to help if I can, uh, just hit me up on Instagram. I really appreciate you having us, uh, Patrick. Once again, this is uh, Ryan Houston. Uh, my other business partners, Ryan G. Julianus, and uh, any of the, any of the shops can hit us up at any time, and uh, love to hear from. Don't forget, Diesel fans. If there's any questions that you have for Lenny about some of the business topics that he was, you know, talking about, or any any questions as far as balance and and making sure that that you're successful in this career that you've chosen, just reach out to him. He's more than happy to chat with you. And if you have questions on products, injector sets, whether it's for your daily driver, work truck, or a race vehicle, hit up the guys at Dynamite Diesel. They'll get you taken care of. Till next time, keep the shiny side up.